today we start lecture 4-1 on the system properties of linearity and time invariance. This is from chapter 4 of the course notes and the objective of today's lecture are to define the system properties linearity and time invariance and to determine if a system is linear and or time invariant. A system is linear if it is both additive and homogeneous, which means it satisfies properties of addition and multiplication, which means that for an input alpha 1 x1 of t plus alpha 2 x2 of t, the output would be alpha 1 y1 of t plus alpha 2 y2 of t. A quick way to determine if a system is homogeneous is to test whether the output is zero when the input is zero, so that there cannot be any energy stored in the system or any initial conditions. A system that is not linear is said to be nonlinear. The following signal flow graph can be used to test if a system is linear. The first thing you do is given the input x1 of t, you multiply it by alpha 1, and given the output x2 of t, you multiply it by alpha 2. Then you send it through the function for the output signal and find z1 of t. Then you, for the second row of the signal flow graph, you take x1 of t and send it to the function to produce y of t. You take x2 of t and send it through the function to produce y2 of t, and then multiply those outputs by alpha 1 and alpha 2. And this should produce the sum alpha 1 y1 of t plus alpha 2 y2 of t, and that produces z2 of t. If when you do this z1 equals z2, you can say that the system is linear. A system is time invariant if for the input x of t at any time t1, the response to the shifted input x of t minus t1 is equal to y of t minus t1, where y of t is the response to x of t with zero initial energy. A system is time varying if it is not time invariant. We use the signal flow graph in figure two in order to test a system for time invariance. First, we take the input x of t and delay it by t1, and then send it through the function that produces y of t or gets z1 of t. Then we take x of t, send it through the function that produces y of t, then delay that output by t1 and make that z2 of t. If z1 of t equals z2 of t, then we say that the system is time invariant. Okay, let's look at an example. Determine if the system described by the following equation is linear and time invariant. y of t is equal to 2x of t plus 3. Another way to write this is that the function that acts on x of t is 2x of t plus 3. So this means that if I have an input x1 of t and it goes through my function h, then the output would be 2x of t, 2x1 of t plus 3. So now, what if we have an input alpha x1 of t plus alpha 2 x2 of t? This is now my input, and if it goes through my function h, then the output should be 2 times the input plus 3. So that's going to be 2 times the quantity alpha 1 x1 of t plus alpha 2 x2 of t plus 3. So if we call this function z1 of t, now we take the output due to x1 and x2 and multiply that by alpha 1 and alpha 2. So in other words, x2 of t, if I send that through my function, the output would be 2 x2 of t plus 3, where this represents y1 of t and the second one would represent y2 of t. So now z2 of t would be equal to alpha 1 y1 of t plus alpha 2 y2 of t. So this is going to be alpha 1 times the quantity 2x1 of t plus 3 plus alpha 2 times the quantity 2x2 of t plus 3. So when we simplify this, we get that we will have 2 times alpha 1 x1 of t plus alpha 2 
x2 of t plus 3 alpha 1 plus 3 alpha 2. So now, what you should quickly be able to see here is that z1 is not going to be equal to z2. And the main reason it won't be equal is because up here we had 3. And down here we have 3 alpha 1 plus 3 alpha 2. So since z1 is not equal to z2, we would say that we have a nonlinear system. There was a quick way in order to determine the system is nonlinear, and that's because it does not obey the homogeneous property. And that homogeneous property was that for an input of zero, the output has to be zero. Here, if x of t was equal to zero, the output is actually three. So it has an initial condition of three, so we could see quickly that this was not going to be a linear system. So now let's check the system for time invariance. If we have an input x of t minus t naught, and we go through our function, we know that when we come out the other side, we should have two times the input, or two times x of t minus t naught plus three. Now recall we had before that when the input is x of t, and it goes through the function, then the output y of t is equal to two x of t plus three. So the other way that we test this is we find y of t minus t naught. y of t minus t naught means you find every t in the function and delay it by t naught. So we will have here two times x of t minus t naught plus three. So since this represents z2 and the first function represents z1, z1 is equal to z2, so we would say that this system is indeed time invariant. Determine if the system described by the following equation is linear and time invariant. y of t is equal to the sine squared of t x of t. So this represents a function that states if the input is x of t, multiply x of t by sine squared of t in order to get the output x of t, which equals y of t. So for example, if the input is x1 of t, then the output y1 of t is equal to sine squared of t x1 of t, or if the out input is x2 of t, the output is y2 of t equals sine squared of t x2 of t. So what if our input was alpha 1 x1 of t plus alpha 2 x2 of t? When I send that through my function, the output is going to be sine squared of t times the quantity alpha 1 x1 of t plus alpha 2 x2 of t. So what is our output if we take alpha 1 y1 of t plus alpha 2 y2 of t. And we now know what y1 and y2 are because we just found those values. So we're going to have alpha 1 times sine squared of t x1 of t plus alpha 2 times sine squared of t x2 of t. And we can rearrange this by factoring out the sine squared of t and in parentheses, we're left with alpha 1 x1 of t plus alpha 2 x2 of t. So if we call this first row z1 of t and the second row z2 of t, we can quickly see that z1 of t is equal to z2 of t. So here we do have a linear system. So now let's check time invariance. If my input is x of t minus t naught, and I send it through my function, then my output is going to be sine squared of t times the input x of t minus t naught, and we will call that z1 of t. Now, what if I delay my output y of t minus t naught, or delay my output by t naught? So now I take the output due to x of t, 
which was given here, and delay it by T naught, which means everywhere that I find a T, I delay it by T naught. So I'm gonna have sine squared of T minus T naught times X of T minus T naught. And this is going to be Z two of T. Now, what you should quickly see is that Z one is not equal to Z two because here I have sine squared of T, but here I have sine squared of T minus T naught. So since Z one of T is not equal to Z two of T, I would say that this system is not time invariant or another way to state that is this system is time varying. All right, let's look at an example. Here we have an ideal operational amplifier and we want to determine if it is linear and time invariant. Recall that the gain for an inverting amplifier is the gain is equal to negative the resistance for the feedback resistor over the input resistor. So in this case, it's negative R over R, which equals negative one. So the output V naught of T would be equal to the negative of VG of T. So if you think about it in terms of our function notation, when you send VG of T through the function, V naught of T is going to equal to negative VG of T. But there's something interesting that goes on with operational amplifiers. We have a power supply that is positive and negative 15 volts. So you're never gonna get an output out that is greater than 15 or less than negative 15 because that would yield saturation. So in this case, in general, we can say that this is going to be a nonlinear system because for certain inputs, the output is always going to be 15 or negative 15. But let's look at some examples. Let's say X1 of T was equal to 10 volts, which means Y1 of T is negative 10 volts. Or if X2 of T is equal to eight volts, then Y2 of T is equal to negative eight volts. So if you make the input alpha one X1 of T plus alpha two X2 of T, and you send it through our function, even if we just use ones for the alphas, you will see that the output is going to be negative alpha one X one of T plus alpha two X two of T, which is going to be negative 15 and not really the sum of alpha one negative 10 plus alpha one negative eight. So now what if you have Z two equal to alpha one Y one of T plus alpha two Y two of T Since this is just the sum of those two values, you could indeed for this one get that Z2 of T is equal to negative 18 volts if you assume that the alphas were one, but you know that Z1 is not going to be equal to Z2. So therefore, in general, because you have this limitation of saturation, you would say that this is nonlinear. So now let's test the system for time invariance. If the input X of T minus T naught goes through our function, you know that the output would be negative X of T minus T naught because it just has a gain of negative one, which we would call Z one of T. However, if you take the output and delay it by T naught, you have Z two of T equals Y of T minus T naught, which equals also negative X of T minus T naught. So it does not matter whether the input is delayed or the output is delayed. You get Z two of T will be the same as Z one of T. Therefore, we say that this system is indeed time invariant. All right, let's do the final example of the day. Determine if the following RL circuit is linear and time invariant, assuming zero initial conditions. 
So first thing we're going to do is to find the gain and to find the time constant. So the gain K is equal to Y of infinity over X of infinity, which is equal to negative one over RA. And the time constant tau is equal to L over R thevenin, which is going to be equal to L over the parallel combination of RA and RB, which is RA times RB over RA plus RB, which simplifies to L times the quantity RA plus RB divided by RA times RB. So the general form for the solution for this first order circuit or first order differential equation is Y of T is equal to K over tau, the integral from T naught to T, e to the negative T minus lambda over tau, X of lambda, D lambda. So the form given our values for K and tau would be Y of T is equal to So given our values for k and tau, we're going to have y of t is equal to negative rb over l times ra plus rb times the integral from t naught to t e to the negative t minus lambda times ra rb over L times the quantity RA plus RB, X of lambda, D lambda. So the first thing we're going to do is check linearity. So if our input is alpha one, X one of T, plus alpha two, X two of T, and we send it through our function, then at our output, we're going to have the gain over tau, negative RB over L times RA plus RB times the integral e to the negative T minus lambda RA RB over RA plus RB. And in parentheses, we will have alpha one X one of lambda plus alpha two alpha two, x two of lambda, d lambda. And this gives us z one of t. So now, in order to find z two of t, we take the output due to x one and multiply it by alpha one, plus the output due to x two and multiply it by alpha two. Alpha one, times the integral from T naught to T, negative RB over L times RA plus RB, e to the negative T minus lambda, RA RB over RA plus RB, X one of lambda, D lambda, plus alpha two times the integral from T naught to T, negative RB, over L times RA plus RB, e to the negative T minus lambda, RA RB over RA plus RB, X two of lambda, D lambda. So with a little bit of rearranging, you should be able to see here that in this first case, Z one of T, you can divide this into two integrals and make it the sum of two integrals and they both will have alpha one x one of lambda d lambda and alpha two x two of lambda d lambda. They will have the same gain k over tau as well as the same limits of integration t naught to t. So you could very quickly verify that z one of t will indeed equal z two of t. So this is linear. And the main reason we can say this is because we had zero initial conditions. If the initial conditions had not been zero, this would not be true. Now let's test for time invariance. 
Now let's test the same system for time invariance. And in order to simplify our notation, we're actually going to use tau and k instead of their actual values. So let's assume that we have an input x of t minus capital T, and it goes through our function. Then on the other side, we would have that the output z1 of t is equal to k over tau, the integral from t naught to t, e to the negative t minus lambda over tau, and the only place where it gets delayed is for the input, so this is going to be x of lambda minus capital T d lambda. So now let's find z2 of t. z2 of t should be equal to y of t minus capital T. So now this takes the output due to x of t and delays it by capital T, which means everywhere in our result that we find a t, we delay it by capital T. So z2 of t is going to be k over tau times the integral from t naught to now, this is t minus capital T, that's our first t, e to the negative t minus capital T minus lambda over tau, x of lambda d lambda. So the only way to know whether this system is time invariant or not is to compare z1 of t and z2 of t. However, as it's currently written, it's very difficult to compare. So we're going to do some substitutions in order to do this. So the substitution I'm going to make is, here I have x of lambda minus capital T. So I'm going to let sigma equal lambda minus capital T. And what this means is that d sigma is equal to d lambda because capital T is a constant. Or another way to write this is that lambda is equal to sigma plus capital T. So now using these substitution, let's try to rewrite z1 of t. z1 of t is going to be equal to k over tau, the integral. Now here, we have that lambda equals t naught. So if lambda equals t naught, that makes this lower limit now t naught minus capital T. And the upper limit is lambda equals lowercase t. So that now makes my upper limit lowercase t minus capital T. And here in my exponent, I have e to the negative t minus lambda over tau, but lambda equals sigma plus capital T. So this is going to be e to the minus t minus capital T minus sigma over tau. And here I had x of, and now lambda minus t is sigma, so this is going to be x of sigma d sigma. And what you should see here is when I compare z1 and z2, the only place where they are not the same is at the lower limit of integration if you assume here, the only difference is I have lambdas here where I have sigmas here. So I can say this system is time invariant, but there have to be some stipulations. So what we would say is that this system is only time invariant if the input x of t is equal to zero for times before t naught. Why does this work? Well, if the lower limit up here is t naught and the lower limit down here is t naught minus capital T, but I know any time before t naught, the input is a zero, then those two integrals yield the same result. So that's one way of saying this will be time invariant if the input is zero for times before t naught. The other way to say that the system is time invariant is if t naught is equal to negative infinity, then this system is time invariant. So essentially what this says here is that I can say I have a time invariant system as long as I know something about the initial conditions. But if I don't know anything about where t naught starts or what x of t is before t naught, I cannot say it's time invariant. And this concludes today's lecture on linearity and time invariance. Mm -hmm.